supposed to go the other way. You want to be on the far side. No. no. We're going to talk about starships. Why are you leaving, Andre? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> sort of like college class. Everybody sits in the back so they can leave if they want to. <laughs> or we can't see you and see in the uh, bright lights. Uh, hello, everyone, first of all. Uh, I uh, want to give you fair warning. You know it's being videotaped. But I'm also audio recording the session, as I have the two other fireside chats I've done. For our radio show, Who Are We? I'm with the Planetary Society. I'm Matt Kaplan. I um, host and produce our weekly show, Planetary Radio, which is on, did I hear a yay? That was nice, thank you. <laughs> there he is. He's even got a Planetary Radio t-shirt on right back there, which I, uh, checks in the mail. Um, <laughs> we're on about 150 stations. We're on Sirius XM, and of course, we're online with a podcast. Uh, so we are going to be presenting this, hopefully at some point, as, as part of Planetary Radio as well. That's a little loud, isn't it? Uh, and um, uh, if you do ask a question, recognize that you may end up on the radio as well. So if, I hope that isn't a threat to anybody. With that, we'll get underway. And there is no session immediately after this, although I bet some of you want to get over to the auction. So, okay. Uh, we'll get started, just as if we were doing this for the radio show. Uh, and so I will say, first of all, welcome to uh, the last of the Fireside Chats here at SETICON 2 for uh, Saturday. Of course, there are lots more of these uh, tomorrow. And it has been an amazing, amazing uh, day. And I want to say that I am extremely honored to uh, have you, Mae Jemison. Dr. Mae Jemison is the, uh, the last of the guests that I have here at uh, SETICON. <laughs> Uh, and I hope that we can talk about only the most recent of the many activities that uh, you have explored in your life, and that is the 100-Year Starship Project, primarily. Uh, but first of all, thank you for being here. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm excited to be here. And if you haven't looked at her bio, you should. Maybe you've heard some of this uh, from one of the other sessions that she's participated in. Uh, just as a minor point, of course, she was the first woman of color in space, period. Uh, and th that was also on Star Trek, but she went on the uh, shuttle first. <laughs> and conducted science in space, yeah. uh, some unprecedented science, I think. Uh, but was a practicing MD, uh, actually in general practice in Los Angeles, I mm -hmm. think, before going to, into the Peace Corps? Well, no, actually, I... Um, mm. I, I did general practice in Los Angeles, and I was the Area Peace Corps Medical Officer for Sierra Leone and Liberia for two and a half years mm. in West Africa. Um, and then I came back and I worked in Los Angeles for a while as a doc and then was selected for the astronaut program. It, it's a total sidelight, not worth more than a few seconds, but you, uh, among other things, we're introducing heat engines, the Sterling heat engine for cooking in Africa? Well, um, actually, so part of what's interesting to me, I don't know about for others, is how your experiences actually lead you to certain places and how they form a background for the things that you know and do and how you have to use your experiences when you get an opportunity to do things or be at, a, at, a, at the table, so to speak. So I actually worked on, after I left the astronaut program, I started a technology consulting company. One of the projects we did was to look at disterling engines for electricity generation in developing countries. So we actually were consulting for a large uh, engine company that had been using sterling engines. Every, the sterling engine is basically um, a device that uses a heat differential, the difference between heat on one surface and another surface to generate electricity. So if you take a huge dish, parabolic dish, looks like a radio telescope, and you focus all the sunlight incident on that mirror to one spot on this engine, you can get an incredibly high efficiency um, for generating electricity from solar energy. So we were looking at how would you design this kind of a system for use in developing countries as a distributed electrical system. So you can put one of these big dishes in a village. 
what are some of the cultural, social, academic issues you have to understand to do that? Because if you put electricity there, they've never had electricity before, if it breaks there, somebody's gonna try to fix it. Mm. So how do you either make it fixable or unfixable and unbreakable, right? Because you understand the sociocultural context that that technology is being used in and then you have to levy requirements on it. I find that very exciting because that's what we do somewhat now, right? But we don't think of it, we don't bring it to consciousness, but as you're trying to do something in another country, then it needs to, needs to work. The experiences that you bring to bear, that are working in developing countries. So a lot of people right now, nowadays, we're talking about how do you do things for developing countries. So people want to do solar cookers. I've never wanted to do solar cookers for developing countries. Why? Because they don't create a flame and people aren't gonna use them. Solar cookers mm. that people have been trying to generate are like crock pots. Most of the women who are cooking in those countries, they use fire, they were cooking over three stone fire. So all of a sudden you're gonna invent something that nobody wants, that it's gonna require completely cultural change and overlay. And if you just paid attention, you might have been using biogas to create a flame. So that's where sort of the socio-cultural context comes in and why it tells us we have to change the way we do things. That's what we also want to bring and understand as we go into space, how we use these tools. And even further, if we start talking about actually going to another star system, which we are talking about, going to another star system, what socio-cultural mm -hmm. context do you bring to bear? How do those things uh, uh, impact the questions we ask and what we want to do with the technologies. And that's exactly what I found so interesting about this because it does tie directly, I think, to not just the 100-year Starship project, but your approach to it because you're considering every facet of it. I do want to admit, first of all, stupidly, that I got it exactly backwards talking about Stirling engines for cooking when it was the heat to do other things like generate electricity. But those social factors and cultural factors which are very much a part of, and I bet were also a big part of the, your winning proposal that got you this uh, basically seed money from DARPA. Right, I, I, I sort of think as the, the seed money, $500,000, that's a, that's a nice amount of money for a startup. You know, a lot of startups really would love to have that amount of money, but it's not really that much money, right? Um, but what you get, I think, are sort of, you get DARPA's imprimatur that they think you can do this, which is really very invigorating and very sobering. And I have to say that I'm working with a team of incredible people that bring to bear lots of different talents and, and that we have to blend together. So as I'm looking at this, I'll, I mentioned that, you know, the team, the main, three main team members were the Dorothy Jemison Foundation for Excellence, which is an organization I've had since 1996. It's named after my mother, who taught in the Chicago public schools for 25 years. And uh, my technology consulting company, we sort of came together and were primed for this, leading this. Um, Icarus Interstellar, which is a group of um, astronomers, astrophysicists, engineers, and others who have been looking at creating and a design for an interstellar probe using fusion energy, and a foundation for enterprise development, which is a organization that looks at governance of technology and innovation companies. So you can sort of see that there is this blend, this mix of looking at how do we work um, through large problems, through grand problems. Getting this was both invigorating, yay, we got it, we get, we, and it's also sobering. It's sobering because it says, well, people, DARPA, Right, that's pretty cool. DARPA believes in you enough that they want you to try to create this non-governmental organization that can help to, let's say, shepherd the, the, the development of the technologies, the capacities, the knowledge base to make this a reality if someone chooses to build a, a mission to another star. Sobering for you, maybe, but, and I'm not going to pretend to be in the least bit uh, objective or neutral about this because I am in awe of the fact that this has been taken on. And uh, kudos to you <laughs> and to DARPA for feeling, uh, for, for deciding to put some money into something which is um, so far beyond our current grasp, which I find enormously exciting. But of course, it falls to you 
to uh, find the rest of the money that you're going to need to make this work. <laughs> and that's a big part of it, right? The fundraising. It's a big part of it. But I want to go back and make sure that we understand there are a number of teams that were interested in this, and we want to make sure that we include them in our whole process, because no one organization can make anything like this happen. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's no one nation can make this happen. It's going to be that collective capacity to generate a global aspiration that will eventually get us those capabilities. So I want to make sure that it's clear that um, we've been ones, the ones entrusted to sort of get everything going. Yes, we have to go out and find money. I don't want to say anything more than that, and we're going to try to find money. The good news is that right now, space is in the news, right? Mm. People are sort of saying even um, the government has a role. We want the government to continue in many ways because the fact that people were out there looking at the shuttle as a discovery that was being transported in Washington, D.C., stopping things and saying, wow, I didn't know the shuttle was going to be ending, or in New York City, New York City, people are stopping out on the street, out up on the top of rooftops, looking at the Enterprise um, a flight model, test model coming to New York City. It says that there's an ability to captivate folks. You know, we are looking for those grand challenges as a nation, and really, I think, as humans right now. We want to be able to say that the advances that we made in terms of our attitudes toward one another, that we, you know, this regression that we're seeing now, that it's getting a little bit more violent, we need something else to use our adrenaline for, I like to think. Mm -hmm. Humans need an adrenaline rush. We need something else, and I think 100 Starship is our interstellar flight, our space exploration is one of those things that we can do. I, I agree with you, and I think that 100 Year Starship is one extra piece of evidence that we seem to be entering back into an era of optimism, of thinking, of taking on big ideas, big goals. And I think of on the commercial side, uh, the folks who are putting together a company to mine asteroids. We were talking about that with uh, Tom Jones, the company called mm -hmm. Planetary Resources. Right. People like Elon Musk, uh, and even the folks who want to make money taking rich passengers up into uh, suborbital space. It seems to me to be a special time of the kind of optimism that Andre Bormanis was trying to say was expressed in much of Star Trek, which you have a connection to, of course. <laughs> and it, maybe it's not an accident that so many of the people doing these things now were watching Star Trek when they were much younger. Yeah, I think that, you know, when I look at Star Trek, it was one of our hopeful futures. It said that we had managed to get through World War III, which was very much looming in everyone's mind in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. right? We were managed to get through World War III. We had managed to figure out race and ethnicity. We had, done, we had gone a long ways toward gender, even though every other women were running around in those little short uh, mini skirts and stuff <laughs> like that where you can see their underwear. But, um, but we, it was the first time we had a television program where we had a woman technical person, Lieutenant O'Hara, who was in the episode every, every time. So it, it said that we were able to move beyond certain things. And the other thing that was very interesting about Star Trek, um, and I was an original episode fan, is that it, it allowed us to look at social issues from a different perspective. So now we could look at issues of race and ethnicity and difference, but we don't have to look at them right here in 1960. We could look at them in another future with another planet where a person was black right, on this right, side and white right. on this side and the other one was black on this side and white on this side and they thought, oh my God, we are so different. And the crew of the Enterprise is like, what is You're wrong nuts. with you people? Yeah. You're nuts, right? So you can look at things from a different perspective or even cleanliness. There was a whole episode where you had the sterile germs, right? Where you have the sterility problems. So it, it allowed us to have that microcosm. So I think, yes, you know, those perspectives, having the opportunity to think about those things makes a difference. Doesn't your project, 100 Year Starship, sort of exude that same kind of optimism, even just in the fact that it says 100 years. It says this is something that our species 
should be looking at, and it may take us a century, but we're going to be here to do it. We're not going to wipe ourselves out. I Fingers guess crossed. it does, uh, that it has that kind of <laughs> optimism, or some people are saying, well, we have a plan B, right? So <laughs> we have some place to go, even though some escape we, plan. we have an escape plan. And, and then you almost say, well, you know, if we can't figure out how not to wipe ourselves out, maybe we shouldn't be escaping. I don't know. I mean, it's sort of like the piece that metastasizes away. I don't know. But um, I think that, yeah, I'll, I'll go with yours. I'll go with yours that there's some optimism there. Um, we should probably also make clear what the 100-year Starship project is not. It's not necessarily to say this is how we're going to reach the stars, at least not at this point, right? Well, 100-year Starship, what our, our idea about this, and it's the, the name of the title of our proposal again, was an inclusive, audacious journey transforms life here on Earth and beyond. The big part of that is that the journey is 100 years from now, it's 50 years from now, it's five years from now, it's right now. Because as you start on the task in saying that we can undertake something like this and we can accomplish it, it starts to transform us right away. We will go to the moon before the close of the decade. It, it starts to transform us. We start to think of ourselves differently. And we have the op opportunity to apply the technologies along the way that we, we develop. 100 Year Starship for us, we're creating a nonprofit um, foundation, 100 Year Starship Foundation, that has underneath it a research institute, the way that will help to promote uh, various different types of technologies, help status things, understand pieces, and sometimes do the research as well. Um, the way, because that's, you have to figure out the way to do this, right? <laughs> we don't know exactly how to do this, so you start with the sort of a whiteboard, right? Mm. You have to say, here's some things we know how, how to happen. We know that the technology art is sufficient. What do I mean by that? We know enough physics to know that the potential for creating the energy sources is there. We think we know enough about um, astrophysics and what other parts of the universe that the laws of physics are the same you know, at least in the near parts of the universe that we're going to go to, that we can do this. We have enough uh, data gathering capacity, and we know that we're on this rapid arc in terms of our ability to handle and gather data and to parse data and to understand and anal analyze things. We can do that. We have some fundamental understanding about um, life, some of the long poles, though, is our ability to understand about ecosystems and how ecosystems are, how different parts of ecosystems are interconnected. We have a lot to learn but there. We have a lot to learn. We have the capacity to probably figure some of this out if we're willing to, if we're committed to. So a lot of this happens not necessarily uh, because, our, let's put it this way, a lot of the issue in whether we can do this has to do more with commitment and willingness rather than technological mm -hmm. complications. Don't get me wrong, the technological challenges are huge. But we can approach them, and we probably can get a long ways to solve them. But we never will if we're not committed to doing it. So for example, I always like to use the example of the superconducting super collider. Because we halfway had the thing built. We halfway had the thing built. And then we said, well, no, we're not going to spend another $6 billion on that. Tragedy. So let's go. Let's get rid of it. What does that mean? It means that now some of the types of research that we would have to do in terms of looking at antimatter, we're looking at that really hard, some of the physics stuff and trying to understand some of the engineering behind it, it can only be done outside of the United States. And on top of that, we only have one facility in the world that would do it, whereas we've, we had two facilities, it starts to make this process easier, and we start to talk about energy in a different way. So it makes a difference that people are committed. If someone would, if people were up, up and arms about it, the public at large, not just the physicists, right, but the public at large, if they were up in arms and said, we want the United States to continue to have the capacity to push the envelopes of research, then that $6 billion, which is a lot of money, but in the scale of budgets and things in the US, it's a small amount of money. And it's an investment. And it's an investment. It's not throwing it away in space or down a hole. Exactly.
Um, we, uh, I'm sure people would be happy to hear you just continue to talk about the inspiration behind this, but we do want to open this up for questions from all of you out there. And uh, so if anyone has one right off the bat, go ahead and raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm going to throw another one at you, which is, has to do, and I don't see any hands yet. Oh, okay. Sorry, it's these lights. Please, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Richard Fields, and I have a question. Is it open now for discussion, the 100-year uh, project, 100 uh, uh, spaceship project? Is it in the social media right now? Is it, can people participate in the discussion, the dialogue right now? Yeah, it's a good question, because you had to keep this under wraps, which must have killed you for a period of some <laughs> weeks or months. If it didn't kill me, it killed my team members. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, inside jokes. Um, <laughs> So yes, we're, we're opening up. We actually have a public symposium that will take place in September in Houston, the 13th through the 16th. Go to 100yss.org. Thank you for allowing me to do that. And at it, we will actually have technical tracks where uh, time distance solutions, what are some of the issues. You have to go really fast. When you go really fast, you have to figure out how to slow down. You have to figure out how to navigate. Um, you have to figure out what happens to materials if they take a long time and they're exposed to space. We're looking at um, life science issues, not just humans and how we adapt to weightlessness and how we survive, but um, agriculture, animal life. How do you use weightlessness as a platform? We are looking at becoming an interstellar civilization. What does that actually mean? What are the economics of this? Um, how do you pay for it? Um, what are the philosophical implications or ramifications of it? Lots of different things. We are looking at um, destinations and habitats. Where do you go? What, can, what do you do when you get there? We're going to have classes, uh, solar system 101, ethics 101. I want to draw really pretty space pictures, um, <laughs> tracks for teachers. So we'll have a lot of different things going on. But I want to go back to something you said and address this question. So right now, People see space exploration is just for rocket scientists and billionaires. So what we have to do is change the equation so that the solution that everybody sees themselves involved. That, you know, whether you, so everybody doesn't necessarily physically want to go, even though I find that really hard to believe. But <laughs> everybody doesn't physically want to go, but they want to be involved with understanding and participating from the perspective of I allowed my ideas to be in there, that I looked at how this affected me, that I was able to understand what are these things that I'm seeing above me and how they interact with my life. So our task is, yes, to get people involved through many different uh, ways, through um, you know, whether it's social media, whether it's actually physically taking part in different things, volunteering. So we're real new, we're just starting up, but you can again um, be a part of it. So what's stay that, tuned. What's that link again? 100yss.org. 100, 100 year years starship starship org. We'll do it again exactly. one more time before we finish. Way in the back there, I see a hand. Hi. And how about uh, having information in other languages? I know English is uh, the main way to communicate between people in the United States and this language. But I think that you, uh, since this uh, enterprise is going to take a very long time and you have to get everybody involved at the end, you should, uh, um, I don't know, you have this uh, information available in other languages so people from different countries can join, can learn and join to. Uh, what is your native language? Uh, um, I speak Spanish. Okay. I'm from Mexico City. Is that one of you? I know you speak five, right? So. <laughs> Well, right now, we're really new and we're just getting things started, but I take that as a point that it w is something that we should look at, working on is how do we get in in other languages. Right now, we don't, but if you're willing to help us get it translated, we would love that. <laughs> you okay. And, and you said this has to be an international effort. It will be. It has to be. Other questions? Hi, right up here in the front. Uh, you've mentioned several times before and, and today and in some of your other talks about um, making the entire thing global, making sure everyone gets involved, not just the millionaires and the rocket scientists, but making sure everyone gets involved. 
Uh, but that, that seems like a pretty big order. Do you think that's kind of akin to trying to figure out world peace? Like, are we able to get all these different uh, cultures and people? And are we able to find one thing that we can all sort of agree on? And, and no, on? I, I, don't think, I don't think it's, I, first of all, I have to understand that all cultures already are involved in space exploration. Okay. See, one of the assumptions we have is that space exploration has only been with those groups of people who were able to physically get off the planet. People have always been interested in space. Now, if we do the news flash going forward, there are a lot of countries right now who are not, quote unquote, able to put a rocket up who are involved in space exploration. If we even just go to the folks who are involved with the International Space Station, just with NASA, there are lots of countries involved. Do you know that um, I mentioned um, before about South Africa and having the square kilometer array and how a lot of the astronomy uh, was actually done. If you go back into the 1800s and different places, astronomy was done even from the Western point of view in a lot of different countries. So I think from our perspective with 100 Year Starship is that we are open and we know that we are going to actively involve other countries, other people, a wide swath in, in what we do. I want to give you another example in terms of how do people get involved. The woman who dressed me in my orange flight suit, I have this little cute orange flight suit picture. The woman who dressed me in my orange flight suit, which is that's the launch and entry suit, that's what you actually wear on the vehicle when the shuttle is going up, that's what your life depends on. She was the first person in her family to graduate from high school. Hmm. And her, her name was Sharon McDougall. She dressed SR-71 pilots before she came to the hmm. astronaut program. I mean, came to, the, to NASA and the shuttle program. So that's a, that's a perspective that's different. We know that, for example, prior to 1978, uh, NASA had actively left women out of the space exploration. So when you actively got them involved, that <clears throat> starts to change things. So it's not so much a matter of, wow, it's world peace. It's just saying, open the doors. Time for maybe one more question from the audience. Does anyone out there have their hand up that I cannot see? Okay, I will close there with is one. one. Oh, there is one. I'm very sorry. Yes, yes ma'am. I just wanted you to speak a little more to the educational effects because I know you remember very well through all your work what happened with Sputnik, what happened with education just in primary, secondary schools. Once people get that idea, get that spark, uh, even if they're not leaving the planet. So I, I assume that that's part of what you're. And thinking. before you answer that, I want to point out that you have something in common with another. American female pioneer, Sally Ride, and that you started an organization to help bring young people to science. And right, in, in 1994, I started a program called The Earth We Share, which is for kids 12 to 16 years of age. And we were looking at building critical science, uh, critical uh, thinking and problem solving skills, because that's what I think science really brings to bear. And we wanted to do that in terms of science literacy, not necessarily the next generation of scientists. Because if you get science literacy, then you'll get the next generation of scientists. And you'll also get a respect and an understanding of science from the, of all the people who are making decisions and knowing that they can be involved. And it's not this mysterious thing. Um, when we look at 100-year starship, yes, education becomes very important. And again, that is from a science literacy point of view all the way to the folks who end up designing the rocket engines or designing the nutritional systems. Um, it's, it's fundamental to what we do. We'll be doing things with teachers. We'll be, we have, you know, we're laying out programs, laying out getting books for uh, elementary schools. So we have a whole series of things that we're working on putting together because education is a very fundamental component. And even continuing education for those who think, you know, those of us who've been around, it's sort of like docs have to have continuing medical education because there's new stuff that comes out. And you have to be able to bring this into the, uh, the point of view. Education is really important because as Congress is making decisions, we said about the planetary um, sciences for NASA, their decisions might be very different if their science literacy levels allowed them to understand why this is necessary, that you can't necessarily just re-up it a little bit later. So science literacy is important across the board. 
I'm going to close out with using my prerogative as a moderator to ask one last question. And I think you've already answered this in a way. Your project, let's say, is successful beyond, perhaps not your wildest dreams, but beyond the wildest dreams of a lot of people. And uh, there's a starship ready to go in 15 years. Do you want to be part of the crew? Yeah. I'm on, I'm on <laughs> prerogative as the lead of the project. I get to go. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Dr. Mae Jemison for joining us. And thank all of you for joining us and for your great questions and for being part of this today. And enjoy SETICON uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks.